global tensions rising, nuclear weapons stockpile at an all-time high, is the possibility of a nuclear apocalypse finally upon us? Are radiation-resistant superbugs the answer to it all? My name is Jack, and we talk about the business of science and how the latest headlines in science and technology informs us about the jobs of the future. Now, in my limited spare time, I am a gamer, and one of the most famous gaming series in the history of gaming series is, of course, Fallout. Geopolitical tensions leading to an all-out nuclear winter, and how humans and the leftover humans put it all together and fight for the scraps that are left behind. The release of a trailer for Fallout TV on Amazon, the power suits that these people in the nuclear winter would have to wear to survive that incoming radiation, iconic uh, blue and yellow jumpsuits that the people would wear, people try to stay within a vault to hide from the radiation up on the surface, the Brotherhood of Steel's different machinery, vivid power armor imagery. It has all the makings of potentially a great series, although as a fan of both TV shows, cinema and games, the overlap of those three things don't typically go great. Usually some creator ruins the story for the games. In all of the Fallout games, there's one recurring problem. There are very, very scarce natural resources. They're usually trying to find some water purifying chip or machine to keep the water supplies going for a small village. If there was a mechanism to make those resources free of radiation, that would be one piece of the puzzle if there was indeed an unfortunate nuclear winter ahead of us. I'm not a nuclear physicist, but where I do come into the picture is I'm a microbiologist. Superbugs, the idea of these really highly evolved microorganisms that can survive in all sorts of different environments, we have a lot to say when it comes to being able to adapt and survive to different chemical or environmental conditions. And radiation is no different. Researchers who worked at Oregon State University more than 60, 70 years ago, discovered a bacterium called D. radiodurans, which could withstand levels of radiation thousands of times higher than most animals can, and that of course includes us. And these bacteria not only live in the core of nuclear reactors, it can survive toxic chemicals, corrosive acids, extreme heat, sub-zero temperatures, and the vacuums of space. And this category of bacteria very broadly is called an extremophile. They can live in very extreme conditions, and understanding their biology. Understanding the genes, the DNA that they have, or the ability to repair that DNA is very informative as to what we need to be able to survive those very same conditions. So understanding the superbugs biological mechanisms could very much help us survive the future apocalypse of whatever variety, whether it be nuclear or climate change. Understanding fundamentals of biology is always a good idea. And one distinct application of the use of these superbugs, their ability to help remove radioactive waste. In a process, is referred to very broadly as bioremediation. This article from the American Society for Microbiology really goes through this at a pretty fundamental level. It highlights all the different ways radiation can harm us, whether it be through exposure to beta or gamma radiation that then could cause things all the way ranging from cataracts through to thyroid cancer. It could be these airborne radioactive particles after the blow and the blast of an atomic bomb and over time inhaling this could lead to lung cancer as well if not direct exposure as well as the reservoirs of food, the crops, the soil, anything that's able to survive in there will definitely be contaminated by that radiation and we will consume that contaminated food because we have no choice. And again, we will store that over time and damage our body, damage our genetic material and either have cancer or die very, very quickly from radiation exposure. And one of the ways around this is to really leverage bacteria, superbugs that can live in this kind of environment who can interact with this radioactive waste and mitigate it, lessen it or help concentrate it in a way that we can then remove it more easily from a very broad landscape. It could do so in a number of different ways, bioreduction, bioaccumulation, bioabsorption, biomineralization, but all of those collectively have the same underlying philosophy. There are radioactive particles, radioactive waste that we cannot actually gather up and remove, but these bacteria will be able to interface with these radioactive particles because of the processes that they contain, that they're able to survive in these really harsh toxic chemicals. They can either concentrate those chemicals and force them to be precipitated, into solid minerals or crystals. And then it's very easy for us to see, oh look, there's a crystal, there's a mineral, that is radioactive waste. We can then physically remove that crystal as opposed to these amorphous, invisible radioactive particles that are impossible to see and impossible to remove. And it's the same bacteria that was discovered in 1956 by those University of Oregon researchers. 
Dinococcus radiodurans, the radiodurans, it can resist extremely high concentrations of radioactivity due to a couple of very interesting mechanisms. It has very many different antioxidant systems. We have free radicals that come into our body. The antioxidizing compounds that this bacteria makes counteracts the toxic properties of those free radicals. The radiation that it emits is going to damage your DNA and Dinococcus radiodurans does indeed have a very enhanced DNA repair mechanism. We don't just have to rely on the natural occurring D radiodurans in its natural state. We can genetically engineer it. In fact, we can imbue it with a gene from a different bacteria, the E. coli Mer A gene, which can convert a more toxic mercury compound into a more simplistic elemental mercury compound, which is much less toxic and more readily removed. Whether it be biomineralization, bioprecipitation, or bioabsorption or bioaccumulation, all of this relies on the bacteria or the superbug's ability to first of all survive in that radioactive environment, secondly to have a metabolic process to interact with these radioactive particles, and thirdly to convert that radioactive waste from a version which we cannot really process, we cannot get rid of that easily, into something that we can visually see and physically remove from the site. And if we go to the version of events depicted in a fallout where contaminated water all over the place, then having these other ways of purifying the water through bioremediation is one way to help us survive that much longer if the inevitable nuclear apocalypse comes our way. Nuclear apocalypses aren't the first thing you find when you Google the term superbug. What you actually find is the application of bacteria towards hospitals and clinics because the idea of bacteria being a villain rather than a helpful superhero has been the main narrative. Superbugs are bugs that are impossible to kill and we are usually in the role of trying to kill those superbugs because they are affecting our body and making us sick. Let's say you have surgery, your surgeon cuts the skin open and you bandage it up, but that wound then becomes infected by a drug resistant bacteria that no matter what antibiotics we can give to kill that bacteria, it stays alive and that wound gets infected and your arm falls off and all sorts of terrible things happen and that bacteria can spread in the community and cause all sorts of havoc. To understand how bacteria actually became resistant to antibiotics in the first place, it became superbugs. This is at its core a story about adaptation. If you expose a population of bacteria to a very toxic chemical, an antibiotic that's designed to kill them, there could be out of a million bacteria, maybe 20 of them are naturally resistant. And all of a sudden, after that danger of the antibiotic goes away, there are still 20 bacteria left over. And those 20 are the strongest within that community. And the thing about bacteria is that they have only one agenda and that is to replicate and survive for another day, keep growing and dividing and dividing. And they grow really, really quickly. Some species such as E. coli can replicate as quickly as every 20 minutes. And one bacteria can become 68 billion bacteria in 12 hours. When you replicate so fast, copying DNA is not an error-proof process. All of those mutations in the DNA could lead to many different directions. Could be a bad mutation that then kills the bacteria, or it could lend itself to a positive new superpower when a catalytic event comes along trying to kill all the bacteria all of these different mutations, all of these superpowers come to the forefront and the best gets chosen to survive to see another day. Once the bacteria have found the magic source, have found a gene that's got a mutation that allows them to survive for a little bit longer, bacteria very freely pass genetic material between each other. They share the goodies. One bacterial cell that has a gene that's resistant can very easily pass that gene to another bacterial cell. Doesn't have to be the same species of bacteria, it can be other species of bacteria. And all of a sudden that antibiotic no longer kills anything because the bacteria has been very dutifully passing on its secret this gene to all the different bacteria that comes into its immediate orbit. Bacteria can either prevent the antibiotic from ever getting inside the cell by keeping it out, making the cell wall thicker so that the antibiotics can't come in. Even if the antibiotic does get in, it can push it back out through different pumps, efflux pumps. It could also have a slightly different version of the molecule that the antibiotic is supposed to bind to. And if it can't bind to it that tightly, the antibiotic kind of falls off and the bacteria is able to swim away and live another day. And the last way that bacteria can avoid being killed by antibiotics is to make a chemical that just goes out there and cuts that antibiotic in half. And the most famous example of this is beta-lactamases. These are enzymes made by bacteria that specifically bind to antibiotics that have a beta-lactam ring. 
which is a chemical structure found in many of the penicillins, the most common, the earliest antibiotics that we know of. And these beta-lactamase enzymes made by the bacteria go out there and bind to the beta-lactam antibiotics and chop it in half or make it inactive before they have a chance to come into close vicinity of the bacteria. All of this replication, all of this evolution, all of this pressure to change over time is what gives bacteria the ability to survive in radioactive wastelands as well as to survive in hospitals even though we're cleaning things down all the time and giving these vulnerable patients all of these antibiotics. It's not just a biological problem, it's also a social problem, a communication problem in many ways because we are making the problem worse by giving antibiotics out too frequently. This population of very different bacteria with all of their different genes and mutations, there's no need for the super resistant superbug to be the dominant face of that bacterial community if the antibiotic wasn't introduced in the first place, right? If all of a sudden they weren't the one with the huge advantage of being able to live in the presence of this chemical, they will not become the dominant species. They will not be passing that gene around. So really we need to be using antibiotics very sparingly, but just think back to the last time you had a cold and you went to the doctors and you left the doctors not getting a script for anything, not getting an antibiotic because you were told a cough or a sore throat, 70 to 80% of the time is caused by viruses. So if you go to a doctor and they give you an antibiotic, they're actually contributing to the problem unless they understand a bit more about your patient history. Let's say you've been sick for a couple of weeks now. That likelihood of you still being infected by a virus is quite a bit lower. The odds of it being bacterial are a little bit higher, not to mention you may have contracted a secondary infection from a bacteria after the virus caused the initial infection. If you left that initial consult with the doctor, not with any medication, and you just told, look, it's going to get better over time, you didn't feel that great about that doctor, right? You feel like, hey, I just paid some money to see you and you didn't give me any drugs to help me feel better. That puts a little bit of pressure on these practitioners to give you medication. In Australia, we're seeing a really interesting test case of how antibiotics can be prescribed or should be prescribed. UTIs, or urinary tract infections, affect half of Australian women. Pharmacy treatment could soon be an option. A parliamentary committee in Australia spent nine months investigating UTIs and the treatments, recommending ultimately that pharmacists be given the power to prescribe antibiotics for UTIs, instead of waiting a long time to see a doctor, to see a general practitioner, to only then receive the same drug you could have received from the pharmacist maybe two weeks earlier. This article really highlights the empowerment of pharmacists as healthcare professionals because they believe they can't give a great treatment or management plan without referring them to a GP under the current prescribing rules. And there are a lot of patients who are suffering, who are waiting a long time with this very painful urinary tract infection. It hurts every time you need to do a wee. There's constant burning sensation. Often it keeps coming back as well after the first treatment. So you don't want to go see a doctor and then it comes back. You have to line up again to go see a doctor. This recommendation in South Australia basically says pharmacists should be able to prescribe these antibiotics to women. Doctors in Australia and the pharmacists, they're in the middle of a turf war. They can't really agree on what's the best practice. Doctors will say, no, 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 pharmacists can't do it. Only doctors can do it with all the full medical history. Pharmacist says, look, we got to treat the patient first and put the patient first and we can get the medication to them more quickly. What's the harm? Both sides, doctors and pharmacists are accusing each other of financial motives. Hey, we can make more money from seeing the patients or prescribing antibiotics earlier. The human problem makes this a more difficult solution. You can see this is quite a complicated problem that we have on our hands and it's not going to go away anytime soon. As the bacteria gets exposed to the same antibiotic again and again, natural selection will make it so that the superbug with the gene that is best optimized to survive then becomes a dominant face of that bacterial community, then spreads that gene anywhere it can see fit. There are first line antibiotics that you can get a lot more easily at the pharmacy. The resistance to those will become more widespread and now we'll have to roll out these second line or last line antibiotics that we usually reserve for very, very severe infections. We have to use them more routinely and they then become more resistant or more resistance becomes developed against them. And we're gonna run out of antibiotics because discovering antibiotics is a very tricky proposition. Is there anything we can do to prevent antibiotic resistance? We can raise awareness that many infections will get better by themselves, monitor the infections due to resistant bacteria more closely, more rapidly, so that you don't then keep prescribing that antibiotic that has already a developed resistance profile in the community. Reducing the inappropriate use of antibiotics in animals, which is a really 
really interesting problem in Australia, certainly, and I'm sure in other parts of the world as well, the agricultural and livestock practices involve using antibiotics into the feed for pigs and cows and animals because a lot of antibiotics can be used to promote growth. More meat means the farmer can make more money on the sale of the animal to supermarkets. Having antibiotics fed into your food every single day is going to make any bacteria still living on those animals superbugs almost by default. And of course, continuing to develop new antibiotics is a necessary thing we have to do, but developing new antibiotics is easier said than done. The newest antibiotic is one called Clovibactin. Will it beat superbugs or will it join a long list of failed drugs? Clovibactin was a recently discovered antibiotic that works a little differently than other antibiotics on the market. It targets bacteria from the inside out, taking away the bricks that are used to build the wall that prevents antibiotics to get in. In the first place, bacteria then have much more limited options when choosing which bricks to build their walls and cell walls, and therefore resistance is much less likely to develop. Any antibiotic over time becomes less and less effective. The antibiotic that is safe in a lab testing condition when you roll it out to large scale clinical trials may actually be very toxic, very dangerous to the people that we need to administer them to. The profit motive of Big Pharma isn't actually aligned that closely with making antibiotics because with antibiotics, you take a two week course and then hopefully the, the infection is gone. But the R&D behind antibiotics is really expensive like with any drug. Whereas if you discover a statin that you're designed to take every single day, sale of that drug is much more reliable source of income than an antibiotic that you prescribing every two weeks for a small percentage of the population in a sporadic spread out time period. The incentive to make those antibiotics and discover those antibiotics, despite the enormous R&D costs, they're not really lined up in the favor together with the profit motive that we still fundamentally need to drive this kind of drug discovery in big pharma. What other options do we have at our disposal? We could have vaccines and the vaccines kill the bacteria through the work of our immune system and we're training our immune system to be able to detect these bacteria over time. Developing and designing new vaccines is also very, very expensive. And the communication around safety of vaccines is a problematic one to say the very least. One other pathway people have proposed is let's use viruses to kill bacteria and we can let the germs duke it out amongst themselves and we will be the last person standing. And this is something called phage therapy. Phage is a type of virus which infects and kills bacteria. Bacteriophage is the namesake of these phage-like viruses. Of course, viruses can infect human cells, but also there are viruses that can infect bacteria known as phages. But it's very selective about which type of bacteria it infects. It's very specific. And therein lies the beauty of phage therapy. Viruses will only infect a very specific type of bacteria, so it won't infect bacteria indiscriminately and then it lowers the chance that resistance is going to be developed as quickly. Whereas an antibiotic is a little less discriminating. It is more, let's just kill everything in sight. And that is how you get those mass community extinction events that then lead to selecting for the superbug that has that feature that allows it to survive. So if the right phage can be found, it can be delivered to the infection site where it will find, infect and kill the very specific bacteria causing the patient's infection. It is a much more precise scalpel. Under the ideal conditions, phages don't affect and cause diseases in humans. Phage therapy selectively targets and kills the bacteria in the patient, not the patient. And you can also leave the beneficial good bacteria behind, unlike many antibiotics on the market. Why hasn't this taken off? Firstly, making phage is a real bottleneck in terms of production. These methods for producing, purifying, formulating phage, making DNA, RNA, and protein and fats, putting them together under ideal conditions, is something that needs a lot of infrastructure to do well, not to mention a lot of skills, a lot of personnel to do very well. On top of that, bacteria can also become resistant to phages, although we haven't really tested this theory to the same extent because phage therapy just really isn't that common compared to antibiotic therapy. So long-term use of phage will be able to test this theory out a little bit more. Commercial viability. One antibiotic isn't so specific in killing one type of bacteria. You could prescribe the same antibiotic for different kinds of bacterial infections. And therefore, again, the, the big pharma company that's making the antibiotic, they can get pay more frequently for different types of infections for making that one single antibiotic. But the phage, by definition, is going to be very specifically targeting one bacteria and one type of bacterial infection. Its versatility as a drug is not going to be as broad and therefore you'll actually make less money on the phage therapy. So again, there's a commercial bottleneck as to how useful this phage therapy will be for antibiotic resistant superbugs. Does that leave us between a rock and a hard place? All of these superbugs, we're hoping to leverage their superpowers in case there's a nuclear apocalypse coming our way, we can survive 
because they can survive and we can use them to make the environment a little less radioactive. Well, they kill us all before we even get to that point. This is where AI comes in potentially. Deciding from BBC News, new superbug killing antibody discovered using AI. And this is the dream. The bottleneck of us being very slow in discovering new antibiotics. Maybe artificial intelligence can come along and help us figure out these are the drugs we are looking for. How the AI helped in this case was narrowing down thousands of potential chemicals to a handful of chemicals that are most likely to be usable as antibiotics. They found an experimental antibody called obosin, which will need further tests before being used. That is the recurring theme. It will need further tests before being used is almost the tagline of this podcast. Drug discovery is a game of numbers. Ideally, you have thousands and thousands of potential targets that you extract from libraries of drugs. There are thousands of compounds, but we don't have the resources to test all of them to the level of depth that we need to check if it's really safe. And the AI was trained on chemical features of drugs that could attack problematic bacterium, then used on a library of over 6,680 compounds whose effectiveness was unknown. And AI took an hour and a half to whittle that list down to produce a short list of about 240. And then when they tested 240 in the lab, they found nine potential antibodies. And one of those nine was the incredibly potent antibiotic abosin. So you can really see it's a numbers game, isn't it? From 6,680 targets down to one very potent antibiotic. This still counts as a tremendous success, even though the success rate is one in 6,680, right? All you need is one. This is when the work starts. Despite how quickly AI whittled down that list of antibiotics down to 240, then down to nine, then down to one, they expect the first AI antibody could take until 2030 until all the testing is finished and there available to be prescribed. A huge lag from initial discovery to clinical use. Hence, we need a constant pipeline of antibiotics being discovered again and again. But nevertheless, AI has been very useful in this part of the process and that has some promising future leads. The most famous application of AI within the biological sciences is AlphaFold. You've probably heard of AlphaFold. Next generation of AlphaFold was basically announced in 31st of October. And what it's able to do is go through and look at different proteins, antibiotics, it could be vaccine targets, it could be certain compounds found in a body that are the targets for antibiotics, the targets for drugs and vaccines. And how they fold is actually a really difficult thing to figure out because protein structure fundamentally is made up of individual amino acids chained up, but that linear chain is not a functional representation of proteins. That then needs a 3D or four dimensional fold that is contingent on all these different chemicals and environmental conditions. And that folding process of figuring out how it folds is really difficult. You can make predictions certainly, and that was one of the bottlenecks. We didn't know which of the folds is most likely to be the, the accurate one. Alpha fold and this version of AI can go through and speed up the predictions of all of these different folding patterns and give the most likely version of the folding pattern for the scientists can then take and make further predictions and do further testing. Because again, even though this is amazingly powerful technology and alpha fold has rightly deserved a lot of the recognition and press it's received, it is not a panacea. It is not a silver bullet. All of the folding patterns that it predicts will not generate drugs overnight. They will generate the most likely versions of drugs that may work, but unless we can speed up that clinical testing route, which you actually don't want to speed up that quickly, you want it to be tested very, very thoroughly for safety in humans, it will not actually lead to any drugs that will impact our everyday lives by itself. So without the work of the researchers, the human scientists actually translating the finding, translating these predictions from the AI into an animal model, into a human tested clinic, into all of these phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials for safety, it is not actually gonna make a difference in terms of the drugs you can buy over the counter to treat the next superbug, which may or may not save us from the nuclear apocalypse. If you're interested in the laboratory techniques scientists use to investigate superbugs, you can find that video linked up here or in the show notes below. Hope to connect with you again in the next episode.